and welcome to the engine room. So I'm Charlotte Marcel, um, technical strategy lead at ADBA. So meaning that I'm dealing with all the technical side of things about anaerobic digestion uh, in the association. And I'm delighted to share this session about the new frontiers for biogas processes and technology. So we know that we have about uh, 780 plants in the, in the UK nowadays and so some old ones, some new ones, and, and some uh, developing ones too. We need, or with the, the crisis, we have energy prices uh, yeah, rising up a lot, and, and we think that it will stay um, quite uh, high for some uh, time, sorry. So yeah, we, we will need to have some improved technology, we'll need to, to have very good operating uh, plants in the UK to be able to keep this industry um, uh, good and, and fast enough. So today, we are going, going to focus on different ways of uh, improving our plants and, and, and yeah, bringing the AD industry forward. We'll speak about um, yeah, food industry, we'll speak about any innovation that we can do with, with AD, and we'll speak also about uh, crops, about uh, how you can yeah, do renewable feedstock for your AD plants. So uh, we have uh, three speakers uh, in the panel today. I will let them introduce themselves uh, when they start their, their presentation. And so you will have time to ask questions at the end of the three presentations, so just yeah, keep them in your mind or write them, them down to, to ask them at the end when we, when we have time. So I'm delighted to introduce now uh, Anna Alessi from the um, uh, uh, Renewable uh, Center. So she's a project and communication manager and she will give an overview of the work um, that the, the center is doing on the biocircular economy. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Alessi. I work at the Biorenewables Development Center as a project and communication manager. And today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the BDC uh, and what we do to support the green economy and specifically how we can support the AD sector. So we are part of the University of York. We are a subsidiary of the University of York and we are in between the academia and industry. So we bridge the gap between the academia and industry in research development and demonstration of the bio-based innovation, including anaerobic digestion, but also other technologies such as um, dark fermentation in hydrogen production. So we started in 2012 uh, at the University of York in biology and chemistry department but since then we obviously grown um, and we do quite a lot of uh, research and development projects with different organizations including small and medium sized businesses but also multinationals but we are not afraid to, you know, to work as well with the academics uh, on different grant applications. We had the pilot facilities uh, for scale up and demonstration so um, we support uh, what we called um, a bioeconomy, so the economy that is based on the bio-based products and processes. One of the things that we do is um, trying to find a value in um, agricultural and also food wastes and trying to find how you can convert those wastes into valuable products and processes. The other theme that uh, we work on is the high value chemicals from plants and uh, microorganisms. So that could be for the sectors such as personal care, food and drinks, uh, or, pha or pharma. And we do quite a lot of innovation when it comes to anaerobic digestion and, and trying to find the waste from different feedstock that is available across the UK, mapping uh, the feedstock that uh, is available in terms of volumes, but also seasonality, and doing some research both small scale and, and scale it up to, um, to the scale that is, can be reproduced um, commercially. So like I said, we work across different sectors, including food and drinks, bio-based chemicals, uh, bioenergy, construction, textiles, and raw materials. 
we have this nice arch that kind of represents our capabilities uh, in the biorefining uh, space. So we have a capability in a, a raw material characterization, system development, processing, and product evaluation. And we work in this scale up to 100 kilograms or 100 liter scale. So we have the systems in place uh, to do the scale up to 100 kilograms or 100 liters. We also support the businesses when it comes to desk-based research. So we do quite a lot of market research, um, market evaluation, project management, uh, and so on. When it comes to anaerobic digestion, uh, we can take the feedstock and, for example, assess the digestibility of the feedstock. We can also take the digestate and analyze uh, the digestate when it comes to nutrient content. We can apply the digestate uh, to different crops and do the plant growth study with the, with the digestate that acts as a biofertilizer. Uh, we have a number of small uh, reactors, which are lab scale bench top uh, reactors to the biomethane potential. But we can also do any pre-processing and downstream processing when it comes to the um, AD process. So just a little bit of overview of some of the projects that we've been involved in in the last uh, few years. So one of those projects is Anaerobic Digestion and Circular Economy Yorkshire. So that's um, 0.6 million uh, funded project through the European Union Regional Development Fund that supports the Yorkshire SMEs to deploy AD-based technologies. So the project is nearly finished. So here I'm just presenting the kind of um, results from what we achieved in the last three years. So we work as a partnership with James Chong at the University of York on the number of those projects. And we delivered 31 fully funded projects to some of the SMEs that are shown here. And through this funding, the companies could access our facilities, could access our expertise uh, when it comes to the analytical um, work, but it also um, allowed them to access our business innovation advisor team. So we have um, anaerobic digestion and special interest group that is run by our BioVail innovation cluster team that kind of supports knowledge transfer when it comes to AD and also allows some networking activities. So one of the case study that I want to present is for the company called Verdan Biotech. So Verdan Biotech is based in Harrogate and they are exclusive suppliers of enzyme additives for anaerobic digestion from the company called Bioproc. So they actually attended ADBA show last year, but what we did for them is basically like an independent evaluation of their products. So um, we took some of the feedstocks that they've been um, sourcing from some of the AD plants they work with, and we, some we did some trials in the lab to assess if the enzyme has an effect on the biogas production. Next? No? Oh, there you go. So the next uh, case study that I want to present is for a couple of SMEs um, in Yorkshire, SCRI and uh, Kilnsey Park. So they had some uh, challenging feedstocks. So again, we did some evaluation of those feedstock, measuring the biogas outputs uh, and measuring the concentration of the methane and CO2. But also we advised them on how to integrate the AD technology with other technologies and make some introduction to the technology providers. So um, the Biorenewables Development Center is home to the BioVail Innovation Cluster, which is the initiative that kind of promotes and develops uh, the circular economy across Yorkshire and Humber. And my colleague Caroline uh, is here with me from the BioVail. Next. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, so, as mentioned before, um, BioVail team uh, runs Anaerobic Digestion Special Interest Group. It's free to join, so you can just apply to become a member for this group uh, online. And it's a great forum, you know, to kind of engage with the, the rest of the um, AD specialists, uh, exchange the views, uh, pop questions that you might have. 
but also attend some of the events that the group organizes, um, I think three times a year. So how can you work with us? Um, well, there are a number of ways, um, through the commercial options, uh, through the public sector funding, but also through the uh, business advisory programs. So we are based just outside of York in Dunnington. Uh, you can use our facilities uh, for hire. We have also a conference center um, in Dunnington and we have some spare office uh, space. And I have to stop now. So yeah, if you would like to discuss more what we do and how we can help and support your business, please come and visit us at the Research and Innovation Hub. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, yeah, so Philip, uh, so yeah, you can, you're invited to, to come and, and speak about uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, all the crops um, studies that you've done to, for, for AD. Is, so we'll just check, uh, just check if it's working. Just now. check. Uh, yeah. <coughs> well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Marr. I'm uh, working as a consultant, independent consultant, but attached on contract with a company called Agri, who stand F103 down the way there. Really, I've been in agriculture nearly 60 years, and uh, experience that I've gained throughout that time, and where I'm based in Yorkshire, we are what we were called in the triangle of the generators. So within a six kilometer radius of where I work on the farm, we have Drax Power Station, Egborough and Ferry Bridge, which now the last two, Egborough and Ferry Bridge, have been demolished, leaving Drax. So the theme that came through is we've got to increase this renewable energy because nuclear is going to take 10 years before we come on stream. So the farm and the case study that I've been working with and um, they put in a 500 kV AD plant to electric grid, but then wanted to know what forage do we use. And looking at the register, nearly 60% of the AD plants in the UK are all using some kind of agricultural product or forage. So there's four slides there showing maize, rye, energy beet, and grass. And with the time that I've been allocated, I'm not going to really cover the grass and the energy beat, but if you want further information, I'll be down on the stand at F103 at Agri if you want further information. So I'm going to concentrate mainly on rye and also maize, which seems to be the basic constituent of quite a lot of these forage AD plants. First of all, we've got to understand what's happening in the digester, because we've got four systems, really, of the genesis, starting with hydrolysis, which is the first one. But the one that we look at in evaluating forage is the last one, methionogenesis, where it's looking really at where the methane, the hydrogen, and the CO2 is being manufactured out of the digester. So how long, when we put forage into this digester for its fermentation, as you can see, top of the list in the sucrose, particularly the sugar beet, it will break down and give quite a lot of energy um, by methane quite readily. Whereas the graph slides away down to lignin, which is eventually the digestate that comes out at the end of the tunnel. <coughs> So you will be aware of really what's happening. We're collecting bio -way, um, waste food, agricultural products. They then go into a reception area, going through shredder into the digester, and then that gives us quite a different supply of various outputs. For instance, electric, fertilizer with the digester, also looking at fuel with work that I'm doing with Volvo trucks and Scania looking at hydrogen that's coming from these sort of plants. Looking at the various crops and the ones that I've outlined in red really are the main ones that are going through AD types. 
and you see in the column uh, on the right roughly approximately the amount of methane that each of those products are delivering. So as you see there, the main ones that I've outlined are probably one of the highest on delivery of biomethane. When I put it in that sort of context in the graph, the very high blue columns are all virtually grain from maize right way through. Now, some of the AD plants are not allowed on certification to put grains in as they are classified as food, of course. But again, the biogas and the blue column is made of methane, CO2 and hydrogen. The red bars there is purely methane. But just looking at rye, and any sort of plant manager that may order rye doesn't often specify what variety he wants. So I looked at very, very close observations at these various varieties of winter rye. Over the last eight, nine years, probably looked at 80 different varieties and what do they bring to the party. <coughs> that is just an overview of some trials, generally what I carry out at Brotherton, really look at speed of development, how fast do they grow, so I can advise the farmers what is the best window to trill these varieties to get the best out of them regarding forage yield. A two there, Helltop, one of the Nordic seeds varieties, a very fast developer. Big yield potential we achieved last year, just over 60 tonnes per hectare at a 32% dry matter. Where KWS Teo, a new one to the stable, a very slow developer. So you can see there, Teo will want required drilling no later than the end of September to build that biomass in, in case. Whereas we drilled out top even in November, and some growers will put it in after sugar beet in December and still come out with this big forage yield. Igor and Teo, two new ones, you can see that Igor is certainly bigger or faster in its leaf development rate. And Igor versus SU, Southern Union, Pluralis var variety, which is now finished, you see Pluralis being a very slow developer and didn't want drilling, certainly in October, because you wouldn't get the forage. When I interpret that, what does it mean in results? And I interpret it regarding day degrees. That is really an average of the temperature, the maximum minimum, plus a daylight length equation that fits in there. And pre-primordial development, that is before the internal development when the ears formed in rye around about the end of January, which under a microscope is no more than a millimeter in length, but it's fully defined ears. And you see L top pre-primordial, you're looking at 85 day degrees for a leaf. And post-primordial, you're down at 60 day degrees. Now take one of the slower ones, KWS Ser Serafino, which is used in Rye Vita contracts, a very slow developer taking 135 day degrees to form a leaf. So that variety obviously wants drilling, probably nearly the end of July, if you're gonna use it as a forage crop. Now over the varieties I've been able to look at which are true forage types, dual purpose types, either forage or grain, or pure grain variety types. It's no good putting a grain variety type in for a forage to get the yield. You just will not achieve it. What does it bring to the party, which plant managers that may be in the audience, this is really what makes the pennies start to mount up. And what we've done, we sent off samples away, this is average over three years, to see how much biomethane or methane, cubic methane, is produced from one ton of fresh forage. You see there, two varieties, brandy and Eltop, very, very good, 190 cube of methane. But if you're one of the managers that didn't know really what variety you were on and you tended to drill Beniti, you're not going to get the methane production out of that variety. So I asked the managers, do you want 1,000 tonne of L-top or 10,000 tonne of L-top forage, or do you want 10,000 tonne of Benito? Because that is the difference. 
critical harvest storage. When you're growing rye or maize, for that instance, you've got to have a small chop, no more than five or six mil, where some of the cowboy contractors that are foraging are generally being cut in forage for livestock. And that can be anything from 12 to 15 mil, simply when you're feeding cattle from an open face, they've got something to get their tongues wrapped around and pull it out of the face. Where you put that in for an AD at 15 mil, you've got insufficient area for the bacteria to break it down. Again, that slide speaks for itself on the work that we've achieved regarding rye and what it brings to the party. And then conversely, the disadvantages that it can also bring. <clears throat> also, we use it for controlling the dreaded weed like blackgrass and ryegrass because of rye's competitive nature. No, it's not David Attenborough, so David Attenborough, that's me looking out of a, a crop of maize that got lost in. But uh, just briefly going on with uh, maize, I've got to shut up now, as God is being told. Uh, but if you want further information, I'm on stand for the next two days. Please welcome, come along, and have a word, if there's anything else. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Philippe. <coughs> and sorry, yes, um, if we want to save time to, for some questions, um, yeah, we have to, to let Alex Lee speak about uh, the, yeah, the bags that you can use to, um, to collect food waste. So, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I was driving down this morning and I was thinking about how much uh, I was looking forward to speaking to you all about my uh, topic of choice, which is food waste uh, liners, specifically in a waste management um, context, uh, but also to learn a lot more about the, uh, what happens to the waste once it's been collected using our products. So, so far I'm, I've learned quite a bit and I'm hoping to have learned a great deal more by the end of the day. A um, bit of background for me. Uh, my name is Alex Lee. I work at my family business called Cromwell Polythene, and we are a, a buyer and seller of uh, plastics and compostable flexible films, principally in the waste management sector, supplying refuse sacks, recycling bags, food waste liners, um, and we also have a recycling and manufacturing site down in Derbyshire as well. I'm based up in Yorkshire. And in 2011, I graduated from the Royal, what was then the Royal Agricultural College, having studied rural land management. So listening to, to Philip and, and Anna earlier on, I've got some uh, familiarity with what they were talking about, which is very nice. It's not often in my current role I get to uh, stand amongst so many agricultural-based companies, so it's nice to be back in a sense. Um, but uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, the uh, benefits and disadvantages perhaps of two different options when it comes to collecting food waste in a public sector scenario. Um, so, for context, the, the Environment Act 2021 will um, compel local authorities, in England at least, uh, by March 2025, to collect food waste separately from every household in their um, jurisdiction. There are a few exceptions under the technical, envi environmental, um, economical and practicability uh, method to determine whether you can or can't actually conform to that. Uh, obligation, but most authorities will have to collect food waste separately. And unlike um, agricultural whole crops that are being grown as a feed source, uh, feedstock for AD plants, there's a huge amount of variability um, and inconsistency perhaps in the uh, waste that's being collected. Um, so there's an extra element of complication there. But all I can focus on for the time being is the liners that are being used to collect them. Um, so. <clears throat> There's a huge amount of food waste being produced in the UK. Um, I think, roughly speaking, 25% of the weight of your average household bin is made up of food waste if it's not being collected separately already. So there's a huge case for collecting it uh, and diverting it to a more appropriate um, means of processing, such as AD or composting. Uh, and you can see that the scale of the, uh, the challenge is absolutely enormous, especially considering that half of the English local authorities are not currently collecting food waste separately. So there's just an enormous amount uh, of, of feedstock to be, to be getting at. Um, so I'll move straight on to, to plastic. I know it's probably a bit tight for time. Um, 
I'm focusing on two main uh, methods of capturing and containing food waste in a typical kitchen caddy. Um, and the first being a plastic, conventional plastic uh, bag, effectively, which lines the caddy um, and nice, nicely and neatly uh, captures and contains that valuable resource. The pros of plastic, and plastic's a pretty dirty word I appreciate nowadays, but it does perform a really important function in the waste management sector at least. Pros of plastic are that it's extremely lightweight, it's water resistant, and it you know, performs pretty well, pretty consistently. So you're definitely capturing all of the uh, resource that you really need at the, at the point of the disposal at the household, meaning that there's not so much wastage and, and residents are less inclined to just throw it in the bin because it's easier. Um, and, and really price is probably the main deciding factor when it comes to most local authority or framework tenders for this sort of product. The cons on the other hand are of course the fact that it is uh, plastic. Uh, plastic is not something you really want to mix up with organic matter, certainly if it's going into composting and then eventually onto land as a, as a fertilizer for instance. And so the risk of contamination is greater when you're using plastic. Um, and and I've mentioned recycled content in the slide there. That's something that most manufacturers will be working towards doing, putting at least 30% recycled content in any plastic product because this is classed as packaging. And as of April last year, any plastic packaging product is incurring a 200 pound a ton tax, which is now 210 pounds 82 pence as, as per the last budget, which is a nice round number they've, they've increased it to. Um, so with recycled content, which sounds good on the face of it, brings some risks also of other means of contamination because the recycled material comes from post-consumer sources and it could have all sorts of chemicals, heavy metals, things like that in there, which are very small on the face of it, but when you multiply it out across potentially 28 million households across the UK, uh, any instance of that sort of, uh, of those sorts of nasties uh, would accumulate and, and actually form quite a, a significant problem. PR and communications is problematic when you're tasking or asking for the very first time a household to separate their food waste and dispose of it responsibly um, on the basis that it's going to be become compost or, or some sort of energy through AD. Handling out a plastic bag hence offers something of a mixed message um, from what, what the research has suggested so far. And it tends to lead to potentially higher levels of contamination in the feedstock itself. Um, things like sweetie wrappers and stuff like that, and non-compostable items entering their way into the system. Crikey, I've got two minutes left. Um, so, and then treatment and disposal, um, it, it's, uh, it needs to be debagged. You know, it's got to be separate, and there's, there's a chance it could slip through and form a, a plastic contaminant into the digestate. Compostable. Um, compostable liners. I, I'm, I'm pretty big fan of compostable liners, not least because they are... Um, responsible wherever they've been used in increasing the participation rate of residents um, which means that basically the feed the yield of the feedstock is is much higher where local authorities are providing these compostable liners for free um, on top of that as well as there being a higher yield there is also reduced risk of contamination because where a customer or where a resident I should say is is handling a compostable liner it feels it looks and it smells different from plastic and the message therefore of putting only compostable organic degradable material in the bin is much clearer and much more well understood. Um, and uh, yes, I'll move on from there. The cons, there are always cons to every option. Uh, the, the big con with, uh, or problem with uh, compostable is that it's significantly more expensive than, than the alternative plastic bag. Um, it has a shelf life because it is designed specifically to compost. I mean, it, it could last 12 months in, in the racking, in a box, in the dark somewhere, but once it's out, handed to the resident, it's, you know, it's a, time is ticking away, it needs to be used. And also there's a question as whether it is actually compostable or not, because without the relevant accreditation or uh, conformance to certain standards, we don't know whether it is compostable. And, and by the time it enters the, the uh, supply chain, it, it's too late. So there's a real uh, emphasis from my part in making sure that any company that we're coming up against is, is demonstrating that they are compliant with the standards that are established already. Um, and the big question that I would really like answering today is compatibility with AD processing. Um, the compostable bags are great because they are compostable, but they do not, on an industrial scale at least, compost as fast as the AD process would like, and they tend to gum up the works, and they will, they will gum up the agitators and any of the filtration equipment, and that can be problematic on our operational level. Um, 
So that's something that I'm hoping to learn a bit more about today to see whether there's any workarounds. Because overall, in summary, I would suggest that in spite of those complications with compostable and in spite of the perceived initial cost of rolling out the scheme, I believe that it, it, it's probably most cost effective overall because of the increased yield in feedstock that it would provide from the, the public sector and also the reduced level of contamination that it poses as a means of capturing, containing that really valuable resource. And um, we're gonna be dealing with huge quantities of it over the next three to five years and beyond. So it's really important that it, it gets done properly. Um, so that's everything from me. I hope that was uh, insightful and interesting. I will go and sit down and I welcome your questions at the panel. Thank you very much. Um, any question from from you? So just raise your hands and we'll try to pass on the, the mic. Oh, you have one here. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I can yeah just ask you a question also, Philip. So um, you did all this stuff with, with crops. Um, did you use some some digestates to fertilize the the um, yeah the fields? And if yes, do you have some some results or some study about digestate use? as a fertilizer? Yes, we are um, using digestate virtually to start eliminating organic fertilizers or inorganics. And we had a case last year where we achieved um, over 60 tons per hectare of fresh forage of rye, 32% uh, dry matter with no bag fertilizer, but just using digestate during the season and then taking nitrogen samples at a depth of 30 centimeters to see what sort of a nitrogen in kilos we had below the ground. I was staggered to see that we had over 340 kilos of nitrogen in the top 30 centimeters of soil by the application of probably 80 to 90 cube of digestate pre-drilling. So again, we're looking at this in a more detailed program uh, this year particularly and um, really trying to reduce this carbon footprint of what is really happening regarding agrochemicals and also the organic or inorganic uh, chemistry as well. Thank you. So are you doing some life cycle analysis to, uh, to calculate the footprint, carbon footprint of, of each uh, crop and yeah, we've been doing this uh, actually with the pre-crops, uh, energy beet and also the maize. And we are seeing 
this is the first year that we've been going down that route. So really, at the moment, I have no conclusive evidence, it's just a bit of a theory, uh, but we will see with further results uh, later in the year. Thank you. So any question from the audience? Computer right now. Oh yes, one here. So a question for you, Alex, and maybe a link with, with uh, Anna's work. Um, so, yeah, you don't have a de uh, de biodegradable uh, bag right now, if I understood well, but you would like to develop some, or? Oh, no, we, uh, we do have compostable uh, liners, and we sell a great deal of those. It's actually our, our, it's our preference to sell those over the plastic ones, not least because they're more valuable, <laughs> but also because genuinely they from what, from what we understand, based on the research we've read and the, the events we've attended, they are the most appropriate material with which to capture and contain what is itself organic compostable material. So we do have a solution. And my concern was whether that solution was compatible with the, the mainstream AD processing of the organic waste. Uh, and so chemical treatment or mechanical treatment of, those, uh, of that material might be the answer, but I, I'd, I'd like to know more about it, really. One answer. When it comes to compostable um, liners, um, we, we had a project very similar. So we, we took just the food waste and measured the methane potential. And we took you know, the, the food waste with the liners and also we measured the methane potential. So I can, I can tell you more about you know, this, this project, but it was quite interesting to see that, you know, that it had an effect on, you know, on the methane potential in the lab at least. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we had some feedback from, from AD operators, food waste AD operators with a compostable uh, AD bag for the whole starch one. And yes, it clogs uh, into the mixer, so that they bring a lot of problems. So many of them are saying that they prefer naked uh, collection than composti with compostable bags. So, but in the other side, the public or the people using the, or the, the teddy liners prefer to have some bags. So yeah, I really think there is space for uh, yeah, development in that, uh, in that area. It's just with regard to the naked collection of uh, food waste, that is to say where there's no liner provided at all and residents just put their food waste in the caddy just as it is, um, that is preferable, I think, to all of the AD operators because there's no bags to contend with at all. But the downside of that, and I, I didn't get a chance to touch on it in the short presentation, the downside is that the participation rate drops markedly, that so much so that the council will end up paying more in gate fees sending food waste and their conventional residual waste to incineration or, or landfill. Uh, so there's a, there's a hidden cost there of not spending the money on liners. So liners, I think, are essential, but it's now a, a sort of Hobson's choice between plastic, which isn't considered that good for the environment, 
or compostable plastics which are not compatible with the, the processing equipment. Tricky. I have maybe another question for, for you three, I guess. So, um, we, we had some thoughts about uh, biogas, so biogas being used as energy, we always use uh, here that. And biogas used are as a uh, carbon feedstock. We don't always uh, hear that. Um, yeah, we, I had this thought from Pierre Emmanuel Pardo, which is in the, in the audience. So thank you for, the, for the, yeah, sharing the thoughts. Um, so, do you think that we can use maybe the carbon from the biogas to produce some bags, some good bags, or are you aware of some projects using biogas for for the carbon industry? I'm afraid of hogging the mic here. I, I, that sounds great, and I, I think the the challenge is that you need to find a, a material that performs as well as plastic. Um, that is to say, it doesn't degrade and compost whilst it's still in the caddy or in transit to the processing site, but also breaks down fast enough and is compatible with the, the machinery at the other end. So it, it's a big challenge. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so we still have some time for some, some questions. So in the audience, just please raise your hands or we just, yeah, we can also speak here. Um, so I, yeah, I also had a question also for you. Maybe, Philip, what do you think are the big challenges for AD operators today? Around, yeah, speed stuff maybe? Well, the biggest challenge that we are facing at the moment regarding forage crops, um, it's all dependent on really the price, for instance, of wheat, wheat for instance, um, is it an economic crop to grow? Because it's only a few years ago, we got down to 65 pound a ton, and then people were looking for other crops that may fit in and be more profitable. But then like last year, we had nitri nitrogen at 800 to 1,000 pound a ton. Fortunately, the wheat price go up to nearly 300, and perhaps above 300. But again, how long is that sustainable? I don't think it is, because the market is so volatile out there on cereal crops. All depends what's happened in Australia. They've had record yields of grain. It only needs one country to have a bit of a cold or a, a cough, and the whole world then experiences the problems. So really, it's difficult at the moment, very volatile. And another question I had uh, when I saw your presentation was about climate change. So because yeah, crops are linked to climate change when you have uh, yeah, lack of water or, or too much water. So how do you see that in the, in the coming years in the UK and maybe yeah, abroad? I've been saying now for the last two years that we seem to be moving into these very dry springs. We've had five years now, whether they start in February or even April. And this is really causing great concern where growers are growing spring crops, where there's insufficient uh, moisture, and particularly this showed with a maize crop last year. We at Brotherton, we were down 50% on yield, and we've had to buy forage in to supplement that big loss. But what I found with the rye, it will withstand very, very dry conditions. If you go across to Poland, in Poznan area, that area, all you will see is rye on those very silver sands where there's no moisture and having temperatures generally of 40 to 42 degrees. Whereas they don't grow wheat or barley because of those conditions. And I think it will probably keep going through these uh, cycles that we see. Sometimes we'll see a cycle of wet autumns or winters and then we'll see a cycle of wet, a dry winter but often a wet spring, which we're going through at the March, at the moment. We only had four mil of rain during February, and one day in March, we had enough rain that lasted more than we had in February, so it's a difficult one. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, I think, yeah, we now run out of, of time, so thank you very much for all your presentation and participation, and thank you all for listening and, and, and the questions.